the whole period of, of the, the American Revolution and the establishment of the country, of the government, it can get very muddled in people's minds. And, and what I was hoping we could cover in this video is, is kind of unmuddle that, kind of separate out the events and, and see how they all fit together. Well, you know, let's start in 1775, because that's when the rebellion really begins. That's when you have the battles of Lexington and Concord and Paul Revere writing to say that the British are coming. And they have started to rebel against the taxes that Parliament has put on us. They're not quite clear what the rebellion is all about, especially those people who aren't up there in Massachusetts where the rebels are happening. But by 1776, that's when they write the Declaration that says, here's what we're doing. We're fighting a war of independence and let facts be submitted to a candid world. Here's why we're doing it. And then you get, you know, you're fighting the war. It's really not until 1781 that we win the war. And around that period, between 1776 and 1781, they've drafted this thing called the Articles of Confederation. And it's sort of rules by which the states are going to get together and sort of govern themselves. But it doesn't really create a new nation it's really just a federation of the separate states. And, and this is really around this idea. All the, the Declaration of Independence is really, look, we, we're already essentially at war. This is why. This is articulating why we're at war, what we actually believe in. But that didn't establish a government. It didn't actually talk about what kind of government it would be, how it would govern itself. So the articles were really this, this first attempt at saying, well, assuming that we are able to win this war of independence, how do we set up? Right. And what they were doing this War of Independence were 13 separate states. They didn't really think of themselves as one new nation. Some people did. Ben Franklin and others thought we should really, you know, be a union of one nation. But when they get together to do the Articles of Confederation, really starting right after the Declaration is signed in 1776, they finish writing it in 1777, they write a pretty uninspiring document that just sort of says, we're from a whole lot of separate states, and we're going to get together a bit and be a union of these states, but we're not going to give ourselves many powers as one government. Yeah, we have it right here. I actually had never seen it before, this, this conversation. I've, I've obviously read about it when I was in history class, but to, who, to all to whom these presents shall come, we the undersigned delegates of the states affixed to our names send greeting. That's, that's Oh, I mean, it's like something written by a bad <laughs> template, you know, out of a... Com and to whom it may concern. <laughs> so it's not an inspiring document, and it gives no power to a central government. As you say, it's the delegates of the states. They affix our names to this, and it's the Articles of Confederation Perpetual Union between these states. One of the main things they fail to do is give the central government any taxation power. Mm -hmm. And so really it's up to the states to tax. And then this Congress that's meeting based on the Articles of Confederation tries to beg each one of the states, hey, requisition us a little bit of money so we can continue our business. So, so the, the, the federal, the central government does not directly, there's no federal income tax or, or not any tax of any kind, not even any kind of tax. The states can tax in whatever way they see fit. And then they have to kind of give something. What's them. kind of amusing is uh, we win the revolution in the Battle of Yorktown. That's in 1781. And a messenger comes riding into New York where this Congress has been meeting. It sort of floats from city to city and gives them all the details. And they don't even have enough money to pay the messenger. They have to reach <laughs> in their pockets to do it. So you have this sort of poorly written document called the Articles of Confederation that seems to make a confederation of states, meaning we're going to gather together, but we're going to have our own separate powers and doesn't give any taxation powers. So you have a kind of messy governance structure. And, and, and it's obviously not a perfect analogy, but if we, if we take an analogy to present day, it's, it's, it's kind of what's happening in Europe where there's these separate nations, separate states that are trying to form some type of a union, not clear who has what power. The central European Union is not directly taxing. Precisely. I mean, that's a very good analogy to what was happening because they weren't quite clear whether they had a central currency or not back then. They weren't quite sure what are the powers of each of the states versus the central government. And that's been something throughout history. I mean, even starting with the Greek city-states, where you can have confederations, and it's unclear how much power you're going to put in the central government versus how much power you're going to leave at the states. And 
considering that this is not the governing document for us now, something must have broken to, to, to want to replace it. Well, yes. By, you know, by the time you're getting into 1786, it is totally clear that this document isn't working. You have all sorts of disputes, like Maryland and Virginia are having this horrible dispute over navigation and border rights. And so they call an Annapolis convention to try to uh, fix that up, and they try to get the states to come. Only five of them come. You have something up in Massachusetts called Shays Rebellion, where there was this uh, rebellion of the poor farmers in western Massachusetts under a former Revolutionary War officer named Daniel Shays, and it's sort of unclear what his name was. Shays, yeah, S H A Y S, just Shays like you penny. have it. Yeah, apostrophes after. Well, no, the apostrophes after. Yeah, Daniel Shays was his name, okay. and he leads a rebellion, and there's no central government to send a force to stop them. I mean, Washington's army has been disbanded. And so the poor people of Massachusetts have to try to raise a militia to try to stop Shays Rebellion, but they can't get the federal government to step in. And it was just one of many, many symptoms that we were all disintegrating and falling apart, and there was no sort of rule of law that governed all the colonies and now all the states. And uh, so what happens is people like Hamilton, Madison others get together and say, you know what, Congress is meeting, I think they were meeting in New York by then, we ought to go back to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Go back to Philadelphia where this all began in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, and we should have a constitutional convention. We should write a whole new constitution to govern uh, centrally this new nation. Uh, Most of the states uh, agreed to come. Some of them worried about the fact that we were writing a whole new constitution, Mm -hmm. and so they did not give their delegates authority to get rid of the Articles of Confederation. So when they began in that very hot summer of 1787, it was kind of unclear whether they were going to be able to write a new constitution or just try to amend the old Articles of Confederation. And, and this makes it clear that you know, even after Shays Rebellion, even, even after these, these border disputes between Maryland and Virginia, it, it still wasn't a done deal. A lot of states still liked their autonomy, liked their independence. So even going into this, it wasn't like everyone was unanimously saying, hey, we need to give the federal government more power. And by the way, what does that sound like? Sounds like the debates we're having today. (laughs) Exactly. We still, as a nation, have always had these debates of how much power should be given to the central government, how much power should retain with the states, whether it's on health care or our laws or our taxation. And so it's a useful tension to have. Absolutely. But then they are able to to come up with a, 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 a solution. Well, it's a very difficult problem of the big states wanting there to be, you know, proportional representation in a new Congress, the small states wanting equal votes per state. You finally have Ben Franklin again, once again being the person who works out the compromise to have both a House and a Senate, equal votes per state in the Senate, proportional representation in the House. And they finally come together and they all agree to line up and sign this new constitution that will give taxation authority to the federal government or to Congress, a new Congress, a federal taxation authority. And by the way, that has a preamble that's a whole lot more inspiring than that Articles of Confederation thingy that said to, you know, to all to whom these presents shall <laughs> to come. To whom it may concern. <laughs> you know, well, let, let's, look, why you, let's look at the uh, preamble to the Constitution. We the people of the United States, so that's as opposed to to whom it, all, all, to whom it may concern. So we well, just the, look at those first yeah. three words. I mean, those first three words are totally an inspiring thing. It's never been done before, which is we the people are getting to create this Constitution. Right. It's not the states getting together to do it. It's not the king devolving authority. It's not a parliament doing it. It's we the people gathered together here we are the ones that are going to ordain. A nice religious word down there, ordain. So we the people of the United States. Do ordain ordain and establish. It's almost like we have the power. It's not coming from the divine right of kings or God. We the people get to ordain and establish this Constitution. And, And just, you know, we've made previous videos about the Declaration of Independence. You know, the Articles of Confederation in no way share any of the spirit or the the poetry of the of the Declaration. While 
This preamble does. It seems almost a continuation of it. Yeah, let's read it. I mean, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Now, that's a very transcendent phrase, but it also means, hey, you know, the Articles of Confederation, we weren't really unified. We have to create a united states. We have to create a union. And, and in the, is the more perfect, is that a direct reference to the articles, that that was a less perfect, or is this, or is this a, something else? It's not a very good piece of grammar. As you know, <laughs> you know, things are either perfect or they're not. The notion of creating a more perfect union, yes, they are making a nod to the fact that we have been confederated under, mm-hmm. under the Articles of Confederation, but we now we have to create a more perfect union. Mm-hmm. We have to really hold together. Then they decide, what's the purpose of this Constitution? First of all, establish justice. Uh, That means there'll be one common set of laws. Ensure domestic tranquility. You know, this is Shays' Rebellion. It's still going on when they start writing this preamble. Domestic tranquility means that the federal, the central government, has a right to raise an army. Mm -hmm. And that in the end, the police and defense powers or don't reside with just the individual states, there's going to be a more perfect union that helps ensure domestic tranquility and provide for the common defense. Because what you've had is the Continental Army under Washington has been disbanded. There's no way to raise taxes for a central army. Now we're saying that the union of states, the United States, the federal government, they're going to raise the money and provide for the common defense. There's another phrase, promote the general welfare. When people argue about constitutionalism and what gives the federal government the right to do things, one of those phrases is every now and then we have to use the general welfare phrase and say whether it's health care or anything else, maybe there are things the central government does that promote the general welfare. And then we get to the inspiring lines, you know, the poetry as opposed to to all whom these presents shall come. <laughs> And that's secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of America. And we've been calling ourselves that ever since the Declaration of Independence. But now it's in all caps, and it's signifying we're one nation, not just 13 different states. Previously, I think the U wasn't capitalized. Yeah, in some of the earlier documents it wasn't, and we certainly were not united. It's only under this Constitution do we become, really, the United States of America.